الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على رسول سيد المرسلين الله ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وصلى الله تعالى على رسوله خير خلقه محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين جناب أمزة حسن جلاني سبحانه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته like last week before I begin can I request the brothers who are here for the lecture to make their way forward get closer together Jazakallahu khairah all those people that are here for the reminder make your way forward and insha'Allah, you will feel the benefits of this. Sitting in a halaqa is the sunnah of the sahaba and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And I will start off with this insha'Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa halul uqdatan min lisan yafqahu kuhu. Alhamdulillah. Inna alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'adihi wa nasta'gfiruhu wa nu'minu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi. ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده 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 لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا وعظيمنا وشيخنا وإمامنا وقائدنا وقرة أعيننا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وعلى أصحابه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بالإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى جل جلاله في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد نصركم الله ببدر وأنتم أذلة فاتقوا الله لألكم تشكرون آمنت بالله صدق الله الأذيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما If all brothers can collectively recite with me اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم وصل عليه نويت تعلم والتعليم والتذكر والتذكير والنفع والانتفاء والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على التمسك بكتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم والدعاء إلى الهدى والدلالة على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله وكرمه ومرداته وقربه سبحانه وتعالى أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending endless infinite salawat salutations upon Sayyiduna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the best of creation the first in creation and the last in sending the leader of all prophets the greatest of all prophets and without a doubt the final of all prophets Sayyiduna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam peace and blessings be upon his noble pure family his Ahlul Bayt Peace and blessings be upon the righteous companions, the Sahaba. May Allah be pleased with all of them and all those who follow their path till the day of judgment. Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. And we make dua that Allah allows us to follow their path also. Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. I ask you to come together and close to sit in a halaqa. And I also said this is the sunnah of the Sahaba. Uh, this is a hadith in Muslim. That kharaja Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala halaqatin min ashabihi. Uh, that one day the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he left and he encountered a group of the Sahaba and they were sat in a halaka halaqatin min ashabihi they were sat in a halaka in a semicircle or a semicircle faqal and he said to them ma ajlasakum why are you sat here today qalu they replied the Sahaba jalasna 
Nadullaha wa nahmaduhu ala ma hadana li dinihi wa manna alayna bika ya Rasulullah We are sat here today for two reasons We are here praising Allah, remembering Allah, thanking Allah That He has granted us, gifted us with the religion of Islam Wa manna alayna bika ya Rasulullah And Allah has done a great favor upon us by sending you, O Muhammad, to us Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the Sahaba was sat down for two reasons, thanking Allah for Islam and thanking Allah for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to the Sahaba, Allahima ajlasakum illa dalik aw illa dak, that by Allah is this the only reason you are sat down? Allah ki kasam tumari battery ke wajah sirf yehi hai? Qalu, they replied, Allahima ajlasana illa dak, that by Allah we are not sat here for any other reason other than to thank Allah for Islam and to thank Allah for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He says to the Sahaba Ama inni lam astahlifkum tuhmatan lakum walakin atani Jibreel O Sahaba, I have told you to take oath I have told you to pick a qasam The qasam is not because I doubt what you are saying The oath is not because I doubt what you are saying But the reason I have told you to take oath is because atani Jibreel Jibreel, he descended and he came to me فَأَخْبَرَنِي and he informed me أَنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى يُبَاهِي بِكُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ that you are sat in this dunya remembering Allah and his messenger Allah is boasting about you in front of the angels تم اس دنیا میں بیٹھ کے اللہ کو یاد کر رہے ہو اللہ کے محبوب کو یاد کر رہے ہو اللہ تعالیٰ فرشتو کے سامنے تمہارے چرچے کر رہا ہے Allah is excessively Baha yubahi mubaha This is Baha mufa'ala Baha mufa'ala One of the khasusiyat One of the specialities of Baha mufa'ala Is What is it? Mubalaga This is for mubalaga The Baha mufa'ala is used for mubalaga Exaggeration Excessively Allah is excessively remembering you So whenever you go to any gathering In a gathering which we are thanking Allah for Islam The battle of Badr if it was not for that, nobody would be worshipping Allah today. And these are not my words. These are the words of Rasulullah that have been given to us through Sayyiduna Umar and Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Radiyallahu anhuma. And I will share that narration not so long after, insha'Allah. So my brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by name, He has mentioned Badr in the Quran. And that in itself is enough of importance for all of us. When Allah has chosen to mention something by name in the Quran, is that not enough of an indication to us how important that event is? When Allah Ta'ala has given something in the Quran, is that not enough of an indication to us how important that event is? When Allah Ta'ala has given something in the Quran, is that not enough of an indication to us how important that event is? When Allah Ta'ala has given something in the Quran, is that not enough of an indication to us how important that event is? When Allah Ta'ala has given something in the Quran, is that not enough of an indication to us how important that event is? When Allah Ta'ala has given something in the Quran, is that not enough of an indication to us how important that event is? When Allah Ta'ala has given something in the Quran, is that not enough of an indication Allah helped you in Badr Wa antum adhilla When you were weak You were weak And Allah He helped you Fattakullah Fear Allah La'allakum tashkurun So that you be amongst the people of shukr This battle It has many many lessons for us But it's also important for us to study the historical context to everything there is a reason we first need to understand why did the battle of Badr take place and you also need to understand the historical context and the historical context is as such this battle took place in the second year after Hijra those of you who are students of knowledge which we all are I am a student of knowledge this is just to remind you you know that life in Mecca was very different to life in Medina life in Mecca was a life of persecution a life of torture, a life of difficulty. And life in Medina, later on it became easy, but initially, life in Medina was also very difficult. Life in Medina, people think that when Islam came to Medina, it became easy. No, it wasn't the case that you close your eyes and you blink and that's it, you open your eyes again and things have changed. No, it was after a number of years in Medina that life started to become easy. The one difference, which was an, an immediate difference was, the way the Prophet could not openly call people to Islam in Mecca, in Medina, he could openly call people to Islam. However, there were still various different layers and levels of uh, difficulties that the Sahaba had to face even in Medina to Munawwara. 
So which year did the Battle of Badr take place? The second year after Hijrah. This is the first thing to understand. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he migrated to Mecca, from Mecca to Medina, you all know the reason to why he migrated. From Abyssinia, some of the Sahaba that migrated to Abyssinia, Sayyidina Ja'far included and others, you know that the three-year boycott, the Shia of Abi Talib, where the Muslims were deprived, the Banu Hashim uh, in particular, they were boycotted on very basic rights, drinking water, food, these things were taken away from them for three years. And the Sahaba say a number of days would go by and we did not have even leaves to eat to survive on. There were no leaves left on the branches of the tree for us to eat and survive on. This was the level of difficulty that was faced in Makkah al Mukarramah. When they came to Medina, you are probably thinking, what were the difficulties that were faced? This is very important to understand Badr. Those people who were from Mecca that migrated to Medina, what are they referred to as? What are they called? Muhajiru. Who said that? MashaAllah. Uh, try to stay with me. It'll make life easy for me and you. The Muhajirun. The people who did Hijrah. Muhajir, the singular, the plural. Muhajirun. The mig migrants. And those who were already living within Medina, the residents, what were they referred to as? The Ansar, which comes from the word Nasr, which means to help. They are called the helpers. Why are the people who were living in Medina called the helpers? Because the biggest issue that happened in or post-migration, that the people of Mecca that migrated, they left everything behind. And everything was hijacked and captured by the Kufar, the Quraysh of Mecca, including their lands, including, including their properties, including their wealth. They just left and everything behind was hijacked by them. Now imagine this, a group of people from Mecca going to Medina, they don't have a property, a house to stay in. They don't have food to eat, they don't have water to drink, they don't have anywhere to sleep. They don't have any clothes to their name. Some even were forced to leave their spouses behind. This was a great problem. Many were homeless, many were unemployed. And this is the reason to why when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he built the Masjid of An nabawi Masjid An nabawi one part of that he segregated, which the people who were the poor Sahaba, they would come and they would stay there, the Ahlu Sufa. The Ashab Sufa, they were those people who were very poor due to the object of poverty. They were referred to as the Ahlu Sufa and they would stay there. This was a very big difficulty and problem for the Muslim Ummah. The other thing is life in Medina was very different in terms of trade. In Mecca, the types of trade and the customs were different. In Medina, they were different. Another difficulty you find within Medina was that there were two major tribes from the Ansar, Aus and Hazraj. Those of you who do not know, remember these names. From the Ansar, there were two tribes, Aus and Khazraj, the two major tribes. And they were both fighting between themselves to see that when Muhammad has come, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, to Medina, and there will be a new way of life, who will be an active participant within this new society? It was competition between themselves. Who will be the most active? tribe within that. This was another time. Now a new category of people also emerged for the first time in Medina. Does anybody know who they were? Uh, no, they were already there. From within the believers, there was a group of people that started to go, the Munafiqun. The Muslim had never experienced these type of, be of people before. And the Quran said that they will be in the Asfal. The lowest pits of hellfire will be the hypocrites. An open enemy is an open enemy. Somebody who is a hidden enemy, on your face he is something, behind your back he is something else, he is a dangerous enemy. This group of the hypocrites, they emerged in Medina as well. Then the Jews, they had control within there, the three major tribes, the water wells were controlled by them, the trading of grains and dates, and even the controlling of the econ economical status of that time, it belonged to them. To encounter these things, was very difficult. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he institutionalized three things. Number one, the making of the Masjid, Masjid al-Nabawi. Number two, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he established the concept of Akhuwa, brotherhood. Brotherhood. That everyone is a brother. And this is when you find a beautiful example that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says to the people of Ansar, that share everything with the people of the Muhajirun. And what does he do? He pairs them together. 
He takes one person from the Ansar and he takes one person from the Muhajirun and he puts them hand into hand and he makes them brothers under the flag of Islam and he says split what you have half and half. And the Sahaba, they split everything half by half. And Sayyiduna Ali bin Abi Talib, he is left on his own. One person is given the hand into the other hand. Everybody has a brother. The Prophet says, you are brothers now. Share your wealth, your property, your homes, everything with them. They do that. Sayyiduna Ali bin Abi Talib, and he says, Wa ana ya Rasulullah, and what about me, ya Rasulullah? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Sayyiduna Rasulullah, he says, Ya Ali, you anta akhi fi dunya wal akhira. Oh Ali, you don't have any other brother. I am your brother in the dunya, and I am also your brother in the akhira. And that's why he's referred to as Akhur Rasul. He is referred to as the brother of Rasulullah by the words of Rasulullah himself. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam. The third thing which was implemented by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam was the constitution of rights and some duties. Everybody knew what their rights are, what their duties are. Despite leaving Mecca, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were still some various obstacles that he faced. The Kuffar, they were inter uh, the Quraysh, they were intermingling with the Jews and some of the other tribes. So the danger was still there. And that's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he set up in Medina an intelligence service. I am using these words for your understanding. He sallallahu alayhi wa he chose certain sahaba to go to certain areas on the outskirts of Medina to see the dimensions in which he could protect the people of Medina. Sayyiduna Ali bin Abi Talib, Sayyiduna Zubair ibn al-Awwam and others, they were sent to different areas to keep your eyes open and see as an intelligence service to what threats are coming to the people of Medina and the Muslims. And before Badr, you need to remember that the Quraysh were controlling absolutely everything. And this is when a caravan which was led by Abu Sufyan, who at that time was a disbeliever. Later on, he accepted Islam after Fat Makkah. But at this time, which we are speaking, the second year after Hijrah, it's important to clarify this because when uh, somebody enters the fold of Islam, everything prior to that is wiped away. Even then and even today, when a person enters the fold of Islam, all of his sins are wiped away. It's a clean slate, a fresh start from the beginning. At that time, he was the enemy of Islam. Uh, he was with a caravan which was coming uh, through the Levant uh, and it would come through Medina back to Mecca. And with that, there was 1,000 camels. And there were 10,000 dinars, and it was guided by only 40 men. There were only 40 men that were guarding this. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba that had left and everything that had been hijacked from them, they wanted to be compensated for what rightfully belonged to them. And this is something which has been manipulated by various Orientalists and Western writers that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he unjustly, he took the wealth which belonged to others. This is incorrect. What is the reason for that? When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he migrated from Mecca to Medina, there were two Sahaba that were given very big responsibilities. Can anybody remind me who those two are? And Sayyiduna Abu Bakr. The greatest responsibility was with Sayyiduna Abu Bakr. Radiyallahu an, that when the Prophet migrated from Mecca to Medina, they said that we will give a thousand camels whoever brings us the head of Muhammad, whether alive or dead. This was uh, the bounty that was being given. Everywhere you look, people are ready to assassinate Muhammad. And who is the one who is protecting him? None other than Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as Siddiq, you find that sometimes he's going to the right, then he's going to the left, then he's going in front of Rasulullah, then he's coming behind Rasulullah. And there was one other companion, and he says, What is this? You are constantly moving around. And he says, We do not know from where the enemy will attack. And I want myself to be endangered. I don't want Rasulullah to be endangered. This was his love for Rasulullah. That he was willing to sacrifice his own life in order to protect Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. But the point here is, if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to take the mal of the kuffar and the Quraysh unjustly, what did he leave the responsibility behind with Sayyiduna Ali? What was that responsibility? When the people came, to kill Rasulullah and they found Sayyiduna Ali is laying in the bed. The Kuffar, when they came, one person from each tribe, they came together as a gang, as a group, 
to kill and assassinate the Prophet. Uh, and when they look, who do they find? They find Sayyiduna Ali bin Abi Talib and he is asleep. And Sayyiduna Ali bin Abi Talib, imagine this were laying down. And a group of young men, big strong men, fighters, whether you want to call them boxers or UFC fighters, cage fighters, MMA fighters, whatever you want to call them, prepared men coming fully equipped to kill you. And he is lying there and he did not blink an eye and it was the most cozy sleep he has ever had. And when Sayyiduna Ali bin Abi Talib was asked about this, what did he say? He said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave me this duty that tomorrow you will give back all of the wealth and the amanas which have been given to me to the people which they belong to. And Sayyidina Ali said, because these words had come out of the mouth of Rasulullah that tomorrow this act would happen, I had complete faith that nothing in this world could damage me at all. And that's why I had the best sleep ever. So my brothers and sisters, if Rasulullah wanted to unjustly keep the wealth of the kuffar, why did he give it back? This is absolutely incorrect. Rather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he wanted to compensate the Sahaba for what belonged to them, rightfully belonged to them. Everything which was hijacked from them, taken from them, he wanted to compensate. But even before that happened, we find that Abu Sufyan, he sent a person known by the name of Amr ibn Damda back to Mecca. And what does he do? He enters Mecca and he starts to scream, woe, woe, woe to hell that Muhammad has attacked Abu Sufyan and the caravan. And he has a huge army and they are prepared. That's when you find the Quraysh, the Kuffar, they make a huge army. And that army was not small, according to some narration, over a thousand men. The most accurate would be 950 fighters. Not participants, actual fighters. 950 of them. 200 of them, they were on riding horses. Now for you people to understand this, uh, in today's day and age, it's slightly difficult. But if a person was to have some uh, technological uh, missiles, a person with a missile and a person who is a ground fighter, you can see the difference, right? Who has advantage? You can see that, right? The missile. In the same way, a person who is fighting on the ground and a person who is riding a horse and fighting, that's the advantage he has. 950 fighters and members of this army from which 200 of them are riding horses and the 750 which remained, they were all riding camels. They were all riding camels. None of them were walking. Meaning that there was no fatigue to them and they traveled from Mecca to Badr. They had 100 additional camels that were fully loaded so that they could feed the people who will participate within the war, the battle. This is one side. And on the other side, you have 313 companions. 317 and 19 have also been narrated. 313. One of the Muslims facing three men. That we now, if you use your brain, your intellect for even any split moment, even today, if one man was to fight three men in front of him, uh, the percentage of him succeeding is very little. And from them, there were only two horses. And there were 10 camels. And this brother is around 150 kilometers from Medina. Imagine this for a moment. 150 kilometers in the month of Ramadan, in the burning, scorching heat of Arabia. The deserted Arabia. 150 kilometers. And the Sahaba, they had turned with the 70 camels. And with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was Sayyiduna Ali bin Abi Talib and another companion. And they were young in age and out of respect and love they would say to Rasulullah, you ride the camel and we will walk on our feet. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, what did he say? He responded to them and he said, I will also walk and we will take turns equally. So that's exactly what happened. And then my brothers and sisters, we know Thereafter, this is the historical context to why this battle took place. When this battle actually took place, there are a number of miracles that can be mentioned that were given to Sayyiduna Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sahaba and the believers to why they became victorious. From amongst them, what do we have? We find that on the night of Badr, Sayyiduna Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he do? He went around 
and with his sword or his stick, he made lines on the floor and he informed the Sahaba that so and so person will die there tomorrow. He said to them, so and so person will die there tomorrow. The Sahaba the next day, they say that we went and we looked at those lines and whoever Rasulullah said will die there, they died exactly there, not one inch to the left, not one inch to the right. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Another one of the miracles which we find, which teaches us that even if you are few in number and you are weak, you have complete tawakkul, reliance on Allah, in Allah, nothing in this world can get the benefit of you. When Allah wants something to happen, nobody can stop it. And when Allah puts a stop to something, the powers of this dunya cannot come together and make it happen. And what do we find? That when the battlefield takes place, it starts to rain. Now, we know the rain is rahmah, right? Rain is a blessing. But look at how the geographical locations of the kuffar and the believers, how the rain it affected them differently. You find on one side that it is a soft surface on which the kuffar are. And when the rain comes to the soft surface, what happens? It becomes mud. And when you have mud, it's hard to travel, hard to move. Uh, you become exhausted much quicker. And on the other side, when it's a solid surface, which is hot, and the rain hits it, what happens? It becomes easy to navigate and move. This was one of the miracles in the Battle of Badr, which was granted to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. The battle begins, and as I mentioned, I have mentioned in the past, it was the Arab uh, trend, custom you can say, that before a battle begins, they have a one-on-one -on -one combat. Three people fight three people, one-on-one, -on -one, and then the battle begins. And when this part happened, <coughs> three people from the Kuffar, they came forward, Shayba, Utba, and Wali. Strong men, and they were fighters. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent three people from the Ansar to fight them. And when them men, who were known for their bravery and their power and their strength and their fighting skills, they see these three ordinary men, uh, they look and they send them back. They say, go back. And they address the Prophet and they say to the Prophet, send us somebody who is equal to us. These people are nobodies in their eyes. To us, anybody who has spent a moment in the presence of Rasulullah, he is the best of the best. In their eyes, they were nobodies. These were three men, Shayba, Utba, and Walid, and they said, send us those people who are equal to us. And that's when Rasulullah called the three men back, the Sahaba, and he looks back at the group of the Sahaba, and he says, Aina Ali ibn Abi Talib. When there's a time for fighting, you always mention the name of Ali, the Lion of Allah. He says, where is Ali bin Abi Talib? Then he says, Aina Hamza. Where is my paternal uncle Hamza? And you know who Hamza is, right? Hamza is that uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that when people would go hunting other animals, Hamza would hunt lions in the jungle and he would take the skin of the lions and place it on his shoulder to show his bravery before Islam. He would walk in the city of Mecca and he would have the skin of a lion on his shoulder. People would rate his bravery by that. And two ladies are walking and they say, Oh Hamza, you are here walking in Mecca, acting all brave. Do you not know what is happening to your nephew Muhammad? And that's when he goes back into the circumambulation, the close vicinity of the Kaaba. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is being accused. And the hand was raised at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he slaps that person and he says to him, My nephew? And that person says, Do you not know what your nephew is saying? He says, What is he saying? And they say that the kuffar, they told, informed Hamza that he is saying that he is the, the messenger of Allah and he has come with the Quran, with the revelation and he is saying that there will be an akhirah. And Sayyidullah Hamza says, if Muhammad is saying that, then I also accept that. And he accepted Islam. Today we are reading Salah openly without any difficulty. The reason to why we are openly reading Salah today is due to the sacrifice and the bravery of two people, Sayyiduna Umar and Sayyiduna Hamza radiallahu anhuma. Prior to these two people, Salah was not read openly. When these two people accepted Islam, they said, let's openly read Salah. Any challenges which come our way, we will face those people. These two people are the people who allowed for us today to read Salah openly. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, 
Where is Ali? Where is Hamza? And the third person he calls Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Haris ibn ibn Abdul Muttalib. And the reason I mention this is because whenever there was a difficult time and somebody was to be put forth, who would he bring? He would bring his own family first. So that he did not want people to say when it comes to giving life and martyrdom, the Sahaba are being used, but rather he always presented his own family first. So the one-on-one -on -one war, it begins. And what do we find? We find that Sayyidina Ali, كَرَّمَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى وَجْهَهُ الْكَرِيمُ وَرَدِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى أَنْهُ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ He is that person who he becomes victorious. Sayyidina Hamza, he also becomes victorious. Sayyidina Abu Ubaidah, he kills his enemy, but he also becomes injured himself from that. And then after this, we find that the lines are made. You know when the Imam says in the masjid, sort the rows out, uh, make the rows complete, shoulders to shoulders, some people should not be back, some people should not be fall. The importance of this is even found within the Battle of Badr. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this is a very unique example we find in Sira ibn Hashim, where he mentions this, and it shows us the importance which we should have in when we are making our rows. And the other thing which we learn from this is the love which the Sahaba had for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is making the rows and he finds one companion who is out of the row. And he pokes him. In one narration, it was with an arrow and in one narration, it was with a stick. He pokes the Sahabi whose name was Hazrat Sawad Ansari radiallahu anhu. And he says to Sawad Ansari, get into the row. You are out of the row. Get in. Now imagine this for a moment. The kuffar are in front of us. And over 900 of them. And the Muslims are preparing for a war. And what do you see when you go on battlefield? Death, martyrdom, shahada. This is what you see, right? This is what's in front of you, right? The chances of you are to die. And when Hazrat Sawad Ansari, he spoke, he says, Ya Rasulullah, I want Kisas. The Prophet وسلم, he poked him, and he says, I want retaliation, I want to take revenge from you. The Sahaba becomes shocked that we are about to enter war, uh, the enemy is in front of us, uh, you know, it's uh, three times the amount of how much people we are, and he, this Sahabi, he is asking for Kisas, Retaliation, revenge, and even that, who is he wanting revenge from? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to him, take revenge. What was he referring to? He was poked by the Prophet. He says, I want to take revenge. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to him, take revenge. He says, Ya Rasulullah, when you poked me, my stomach was uncovered. Your stomach is covered. So it would not be revenge. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he uncovers his stomach. This Sahabi, when he sees that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has uncovered his stomach, he goes running to the Prophet and he kisses the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on his stomach. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, what I see in front of me is death. And the last action I wanted to do before I enter into this battle is to kiss your body, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is the love which the Sahaba had for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. And then you find various examples from the Battle of Badr, the love which the youngsters had. You know, from the category of people who will be under the shade of Allah on the Day of Judgment, one category of people are those youngsters whose hearts are attached to the masjid and to the religion of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. From those youngsters, we find two people known by the name of Mu'ad and Mu'awid. Two young men, and they look for the great leader of Abu Jahl, and they say, he is the one who caused difficulty and harm for Rasulullah, we will assassinate him. And they make it their mission to assassinate him. So one of them, he strikes the horse and the other, he kills him. And when the news comes to Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he embraces them. And though they were youngsters, and the Prophet did not allow youngsters to participate within any battle other than these two, because of how much uh, times they came to the Prophet to request permission for this. This was their jazbah, uh, what they had for participating in the battle of Rasulullah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
he mentions this and summarizes this in the Quran when he says أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم كم من فئة قليلة غلبت فئة كثيرة بإذن الله how a small group of people it overcame a large group of people with the permission of Allah والله مع الصابرين and indeed Allah is with the patient people you may seem alone or weak or a small group but when your heart is completely reliant upon Allah Allah will bring victory to you this is the most important lesson which we learn and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he aids you in ways which is beyond your comprehension we think to ourselves sometimes maybe this will happen maybe that will happen maybe I can do this and the situation will become better Allah he helps you and he aids you in ways which you cannot understand and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he do? He, when he helps, he does not say that you have done it. He calls it his own victory. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمْ تَقْتُلُوهُمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ قَتَلَهُمْ You have not killed them people. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has killed them. This is the help of Allah. When Allah helps, this is the way in which he helps. This help was given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this whole event of Badr has been referred to in the Quran as the name of Yawmul Furqan the day of separation or distinguishment or differentiation what was it differentiating? the Kuffar on one side the Muslimun on the other side the Mu'minun on one side the Munafiqun on the other side the believers on one side the disbelievers on the other side and the importance of this battle was to such an extent that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam he emphasized this. Sayyiduna Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala and he narrates and he says, "Lama qala he says, "Lama kana yawm Badr nazara Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam ila al-mushrikeen wa hum 1000 wa ashabuhu 319 rajulan." That on the day of Badr the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he looked at the idolaters and they were a thousand in number. So there is slight variation in exactly how much they were. Wa ashabuhu salasu mi'atin wa tis ata ashar. Rajulan. And the sahaba were 319. I mentioned 315, 313 have also been narrated. Fastaqbala nabiyullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-qiblata. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he faces towards the qibla. Summa madda yadayhi, he raises his hands for supplication and فَجَعَلَ يَحْتِفُ بِرَبِّهِ what does he do? he starts to supplicate loudly in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says Allahumma anjiz li ma wa'attani Allahumma ati ma wa'attani Allahumma in tuhlik hazihi al-isabata min ahli al-islami la tu'abad fi al-ard he sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says oh Allah accomplish what you have promised me which was victory and he says oh Allah bring about what you have promised me that oh Allah if this band if this group of people amongst the believers is destroyed there will be no one on this earth to worship you then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he continued فَمَا زَالَ يَحْتِفُ بِرَبِّهِ مَا دَنْ يَدَيْهِ مُسْتَقْبِلَ الْكِبْلَةِ هَتَّى سَخَتَ رِدَاءُهُ عَنْ مَنْ كِبَيْهِ فَأَتَاهُ أَبُو بَكَرْ فَأَخَذَ رِدَاءَهُ فَأَلْقَاهُ عَلَى مَنْ كِبَيْهِ سُمَّ الْتَزَمَهُ مِنْ وَرَائِهِ وَقَالَ يَا نَبِيَّ اللَّهِ كَفَاكَ مُنَاشَدَتُكَ رَبَّكَ فَإِنَّهُ سَيُنْجِزُ لَكَ مَا وَعَدَكَ فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ إِذْ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ إِذْ تَسْتَغِيثُونَ رَبَّكُمْ فَاسْتَجَابَ لَكُمْ أَنِّي مُمِدُّكُمْ بِأَلْفٍ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ مُرْدِفِينَ فَأَمَدَّهُ اللَّهُ بِالْمَلَائِكَةِ After making this dua that oh Allah that tomorrow or if we do not become victorious there will be no one left to worship you the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he continued to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facing the direction of the prayer until his cloak, his rida it fell from his shoulders the cloak he was wearing it fell from his shoulders then Sayyiduna Abu Bakr he comes and he picks up the cloak and he places it onto the shoulders of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and these are great lessons we learn here Abu Bakr is the closest friend of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam how close was he to the Prophet 
that even in the dunya he was with the Prophet and even today he was besides the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Dunya mein bhi mere aqa ke saath the aur aaj bhi mere aqa ke saath. Even today he is besides the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam. And what does this teach us? True friends are those who are there for the people at the most difficult times within their life. Aise nahi that when you are uh, in uh, need of a situation and you are in need of help, you look back and there is nobody there. Being there for somebody at the time of difficulty, removing the difficulty for them. This is the friendship which we learn from the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the life of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiyallahu anhu. So Sayyiduna Abu Bakr, the cloak which fell, he lifts it up, he places it on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, in one narration we find, at this stage, tears were flowing from the face of Rasulullah to such an extent that his beard, his beard became wet with those tears. And what does Abu Bakr say? He says, Ya Rasulullah, O Prophet of Allah, your supplication now is enough. Allah will give you accomplishment. Allah will give you what He has promised you. And that's when this ayah of the Quran was revealed, Surah 8 verse 9. When you was asking for this dua from your Lord, this deliverance, Allah, He answered your call. And I will help you and aid you, reinforce you with a thousand angels, rank after rank. And then that's exactly what we find within the Battle of Badr. The Sahaba say, we could see swords, they are swung. And when we look behind, we cannot see any people. We could see the swords, but we could not see who is striking the sword. And when we asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to one narration, the Prophet said, 3,000 angels descended to help the people of Badr. And according to one narration, it was 5,000 people that descended to help the people of Badr. So my brothers and sisters, we need to remember this, that Allah, inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadeer. Something may be difficult for you, nothing is difficult for Allah. You may be in the most difficult of situations, nothing is difficult for Allah. You may lose hope, you may think that there is no way out of this, Allah will make a way out of you. Have true faith in Allah, like the people of Badr did. My brothers and sisters, the Prophet wasallam, what he has taught us in this battle is that we do not lower ourselves to anybody. No power, no authority, no leadership. Our loyalty is to Allah, the Quran, and His noble Habib, Sayyiduna Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. And this is what we really need to establish uh, physically in our lives, implementation of this. Have complete yaqeen in the help of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The Muslims were helped in a way which was beyond their understanding. My brothers and sisters, make no excuses and you will go through difficult times. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Noble Quran, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim alladhi khalaq al-mawta wal-hayata liyabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amala. This concept of ibtila, this concept, this concept of being tested, difficulties, trials, tribulations, they will happen. But who do they happen to? لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. You will not be tested. No taklif will be given to you more than you can cope with. And أشد الناس بلاء الأنبياء. Those people who were tested the most, they are the prophets. All prophets were tested in different ways. But from all of them, our noble messenger Sayyiduna Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم, he was tested in a way that nobody else was tested. He came into this world without a father. His mother passes away at a young age. From one care to the other care to the next care, changing of care. What is this? This is the, in, in modern day, this is a, a recipe for a disaster. Going to one care, as soon as you become settled, you are moved to the next care. Uh, and you are completely a team from both sides. Your father and your mother are not on your head. Biological father and mother. And through biology and the biological link, the love which has been placed within the mother and the father for the child is love like no other. There is no example for this love. However much one may love you, the love a mother has for her child, this love cannot be 
duplicated or replicated. However bad the child becomes, the mother, she still will not let somebody speak against her child. However evil and however sinful he becomes, the mother's love is of such nature. This is the reality. And my brothers and sisters, what also do we learn from here? That success is only from Allah. Success is not from any individual. Sometimes what happens is people become successful, whether he's a tradesman or a businessman or a leader of political activity or whatever it may be. And we have this, uh, because we are insane, we forget. Nasiya yansa, insan comes from this. The nature of insan is to forget. We forget. And when we forget what happens, we think we are the reason to our success. We think we are the reason to why we are successful. We feel as though we have worked hard, sleepless nights, tirelessly, our blood, our blood, our sweat, our hard work and determination has caused our success in life. But the reality is what? Success is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what you call to be humble. We don't use this term up north where I come from, but the Londoners use this a lot more than we do. Humbling. And he's humbled. This is a term which I've seen that the youngsters use it a lot here. We don't use this term. But to be humble, what does it mean? The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallama is that a person who lowers himself in front of Allah, Allah will raise you amongst the people. A person who lowers himself in front of Allah, Allah will raise him amongst the people. But the issue is we are living in reverse here. We want to be raised in front of the people and as a result we are lowered. My brothers and sisters, another thing we learn from here is that a person is never alone. Your mother, yes she loves you, her love is still the dunya. A father, dunya. Spouse, dunya. Children, dunya. Friends, dunya. On the day of judgment we know أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يوم يفر المرء من أخي. On the day of judgment, people will flee, run away from one another. A father will not recognize son, mother will not recognize daughter, spouse will not recognize spouse. لكل امرئ منهم يوم إذن شأن يغني. Every man will be in it for himself. What we really ought to work for and succeed in is to connect. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is always with us. And when we say Allah is with us, not physically. Not physically. Allah's power, Allah's knowledge, it encompasses us. My brothers and sisters, another thing which we are really, really in need of, and I cannot stress the importance of this. In every single lecture I or class I teach, I try to emphasize this to try to change your mindset. Maybe there's three, four brothers who can make this change within their family. And slowly, slowly, we will change towards this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأْتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا We need to become united as an ummah. And this unity begins within our own households and our own circles before it can be done in the mujtama, the society. If we do not become united, we will be a laughing stock, the way the Muslim ummah is suffering today. Who is taking the Muslim Ummah seriously? A small incident happens and the whole world is roaring that this has happened and that has happened. And over 15,000 young children have been butchered in the past 4-5 or five months. It's a norm. For children to die now in Palestine is normal. For women to be raped is normal. For our mothers to be held unjustly it's become normal. It's time for the Muslim Ummah to unite. We all believe in Allah. We all believe in the finality, in finality of Sayyiduna Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We all believe in the Quran. We all believe in Jannah. We all believe in Jahannam. We all believe in Hisab. We all believe in Sirat. We all believe in accountability. These minute, secondary, subjective, zanni, opposed to the qat'i, matters which we differ on, 
يَأْفَرُوا إِمَسَائِلِ Do not let them bring hatred and tension amongst us. And if you try to work on this within your own families and try the youngsters, the young children which you have, the young teenagers, try to build, bring this around within them, inculcate it within their mindset. There was a time 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I remember as a young child myself, that nobody had the responsibility or nobody had the power or authority to speak on Islam. Whenever it came uh, to a fatwa or a ruling, they would say, we will ask the Imam, we will ask the Sheikh, we will ask the Mufti, and only he spoke on that. One of the things which is destroying the Muslim Ummah today is the advancement of social media, and everyone is a Mufti. Everyone is a mujtahid. Everyone is doing ijtihad on his own. These terms of halal and haram and makruh, uh, these terms were not used by the layman. The average man from society will not use these words out of fear. That what if we say something which is wrong, we are accountable for it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that a person who conveys something from me that which is not from me, فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدَهُ بِالنَّارِ I hear youngsters saying, oh, this is a sunnah, and they do not even know if it is a sunnah. To say something is a sunnah, that means something. Our noble messenger, the best of creation, Sayyiduna Rasulullah, Sayyiduna Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, something he did. And when you attribute something to the Prophet, which is not attributed to the Prophet, what did he teach us? You have made your bed in hellfire, now go and lay down in your bed. That's what this means. Maqad, maf'al. Well, this is what it means. You have made your place in hellfire, now go to your place. This expression we use in English, you've made your bed, now lie in it. Try to bring this around amongst yourselves. You will not find a person who is a specialist in criminal law, he will not deal with conveyancing, right? I'm speaking about England. I'm not speaking about any other country. Let's keep it to England. A person who is a specialist in conveyancing, he will not go and deal with criminal law. A person who does heart surgery, he will not go and operate in something which is to do with architecture. There are specialisms, there are fields, there are disciplines, and people are a master of them. This is a big danger. And the Prophet ﷺ, he warned us against this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Qur'an, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Can an ignorant and a learned person be the same? This is a rhetorical question for you to think and reflect and answer to yourself. Don't answer, don't give me a raise of hands. But can an ignorant person, an unlettered person, an unlearned person, can he be the same as a learned person? And the answer is as clear as daylight. No. They cannot be equal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Noble Quran, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ That ask the people of dhikr. This is not فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الْإِلْمِ This is فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ So clearly between ilm and dhikr there is a difference. There is a difference between ilm and there is a difference between zikr. The people of zikr, ilm, knowledge, shaitan had knowledge. This is the difference between ilm and zikr. Shaitan, did he not have knowledge? Big amounts of knowledge. But knowledge, it's not ilm nafi It's not beneficial knowledge. The people who are the people of zikr, the people of remembrance, it's their knowledge which brings benefit. That's why you find many, many people speak but how many people's word controls the hearts of the people? Very few. If you look at the madaris, how many Darul Ulooms we have, how many in thousands graduates come every single year, where do they disappear to? We want to be from Fas'alu Ahl Zikr. We want to become from Ahl Zikr. So this is a very important lesson which we learn in terms of the unity of the Muslim Ummah. And Finally, I conclude with these words that the sacrifices that have been made by these people 
It's because of them we have Islam today. Remember that. Any youngster you ask him which football team do you support and the names of them, he will be able to give them to you. Ask him about the, just the caliphs. Never mind something big. The khulafa, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, al khilafatu ba'di thalasuna sanatan. Khilafa after me will be for 30 years. Then it will be mulukan. Then it will be kinship. What we call hereditary kinship. Uh, deities, meaning one person will become in charge and then his son and then his son and then his son ila akhirihi and that's why we have the Umayyad dynasty the Abbasid ila akhirihi that period 30 years who became the caliphs how long did they become the caliphs for what are the major achievements within that we don't know who are those people who were given the glad tidings of Jannah the Ashara Mubashara who are they I'm not asking I want you to reflect. Who are those people that were not given only the glad tidings of Jannah, but they were given the glad tidings of becoming leaders within Jannah? It's beyond our scope. It's important that we utilize time. The difference between our life and the life of the Sahaba is that the Sahaba, they were physically in the presence of Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that was enough of an attachment that you know when you have light and light shines, even if you don't do anything and you are sat under the light, you will feel the benefits of that light. Because they were around Rasulullah, they were benefiting from Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the unique reality of the Sahaba. We are 1400 and many years away. It's important for us to connect to Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And connection to Rasulullah Is through loving him Loving his family And loving the Quran The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Addibu awladakum ala salasi khisalin Teach your children Three things Hubba nabiyyikum The love of the Prophet Wa hubba ahli baytihi The love of the family of the Prophet Wa hubba qiraatil Quran Aw tilawatil Quran And teach your children the love of reciting the Quran and the only time they will truly love reciting the Quran is when they understand what's being recited and even reciting the Quran without any form of understanding is of benefit I'm not denying that Alif Lamin Man qara'a harfan min kitabillahi falahu bihi hasanatun wal hasanatu bi ashri amsaliha a person who recites one letter of the Quran he is given one reward times by ten I eat 10 rewards. Alif, la, me. 30 rewards. Reading the Quran without any understanding is also of benefit. Looking at the Quran is of benefit. But understanding the Quran is understanding Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the living Quran. Connect yourself to Islam. Connect yourself to the Quran. Connect yourself to Sayyiduna Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم وما توفيقي إلا بالله وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين إن شاء الله tomorrow at the same time there will be another reminder on the name of سيدنا علي بن أبي طالب he is somebody who people are scared to mention if you mention the name of Ali maybe somebody will accuse me of being this or accuse me of being that he is the brother of رسول الله Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam We will mention him According to the Ahlul Sunnah The Sunni works Of Bukhari Muslim Tirmazi Abu Dawood Ibn Majah Nisa'i The Sunni works We will go through the references On the life of Sayyiduna Ali bin Abi Talib And then inshallah We have a very unique series In the last 10 days of Ramadan To connect to Rasulullah This will be starting on inshallah Wednesday um, If you just bear with me inshallah on Wednesday uh, after Salatul Asr because we are in the Easter holidays so Wednesday, Thursday, Friday the 3rd, 4th and 5th April and then Sunday and Monday after Asr as well inshallah we have a five part series which has been titled The Shama'il of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a study of the prophetic character inshallah I will be delivering this myself the way you have come today with love I would uh, urge you all to come again for tomorrow and in these five part series not for me for your own benefit you know uh, when you are here uh, yes 
inshallah, even though I'm strongly against social media, I think this is live today as well. Uh, but inshallah. Um, so try to come here. We will look at various aspects of the Prophet's life. Uh, people fall in love with Rasulullah by just mentioning his name. And even those who saw him, I mentioned this in the speech once, whoever saw Rasulullah, they recognized he is a Prophet. So somebody said that if they recognize he is a Prophet, they surely would have accepted Islam. No. It was just takabur and gurur which stopped them from accepting Islam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, his life, every word he said, there were pearls of wisdom. Uatitu jawami al kalim Short words, but precise meanings. Insha'Allah, we will go through his life uh, over these five uh, sessions which we have. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to understand Islam, understand the Quran, and to understand the teachings of Rasulullah. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. If you can all read Surah Al-Fatiha once, and then insha'Allah we will make dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Malik yawmiddin. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا نحن بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا نحن بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يكن له كفوا نحن آمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد وبارك وسلم وصل عليه اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام وإليك يؤود السلام حينا ربنا بالسلام وأدخلنا في دارك دار السلام تبارك ربنا وتعاليك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكن عذاب النار وكن عذاب القبر وكن عذاب الحشر وكن عذاب الميزان وأدخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار يا عزيز يا غفار يا رب العالمين اللهم نور قلوبنا بنور الإسلام اللهم نور قلوبنا بنور الإيمان اللهم نور قلوبنا بنور القرآن اللهم زين أخلاقنا بالقرآن اللهم نجنا من عذاب القبر بالقرآن اللهم ادخلنا الجنة بالقرآن يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم All the brothers have gathered here today to listen to lessons from the life of Sayyidina Rasulullah and in particular the battle of Badr Oh Allah, I ask you that anything good which has been said, Oh Allah, accept it and oh Allah, anything which has been said which is wrong, Oh Allah, forgive me for saying so Oh Allah, all these brothers that have come here, every single person has certain supplications, invocations, and du'as that he wants accepted. Oh Allah, you are alimun bizati sudur. What is going through the chests of all the brothers and sisters that are here, you are aware of this. Oh Allah, we ask you that you accept the du'as. Oh Allah, we ask you that from myself included, the brothers and sisters here today, from our mothers, our fathers, our loved ones, our teachers, and rather the whole ummah of Sayyiduna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in particular those brothers and sisters who have nobody to remember them we make dua for all of them oh allah grant them a high rank in jannatul firdaus and oh allah by human nature if they have made any mistakes during their life oh allah we ask you that you forgive them and pardon them and oh allah we ask you that when we leave this world you allow us to leave this world in the state of iman and you allow us to utter the final words la ilaha إلا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وصلى الله تعالى على خير هلكه محمد وآله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين تقبل الله منا ومنكم جزاك الله it's very nice to see so many of you إن شاء الله tomorrow will be the same. Inshallah.